Hello everyone, welcome to Reading Cats and Dogs. Uh, we'll get started now. Um, this is a conversation with Lily Chin, Sassafras Lowry, myself, chaired by Christy Benson. So I'm Sazi Todd, and I'm the award-winning author of WAG, The Science of Making Your Dog Happy. My second book, Purr, The Science of Making Your Cat Happy, which I'll be reading from today, will be published in May. And I created Companion Animal Psychology blog 10 years ago um, to provide evidence-based information about how to have happier cats and dogs. So this event is part of Companion Animal Psychology's 10th anniversary celebration. Thank you so much for joining me. It is amazing to see so many people here. Let me know in the chat uh, where you're joining us from. I will be glad to know. I've got a few housekeeping things to share with you at the beginning of this. So this event is being recorded and the recording will be sent out in one to two days because it takes a little bit of time for me to process and check the recording. We will have time for questions at the end. So you'll see that you have a Q&A box, which is where you should type your questions. You can type your questions at any time um, and we will find them all at the end. You've also got a chat box, which I can see many of you are typing in now. Thank you so much for joining us from all these different places. That's wonderful to see. Um, those of you who are here live have the chance to win a copy of Purr, WAG, Doggy Language or Chew This Journal. I'll do the draw after the event and get in touch with the winners later today by email. And in a moment, uh, we're going to all pose with our books, so you will be able to get a photo of us. And I should also mention that we've got Colton in the chat with you, uh, just keeping an eye on things in there. And thank you very much to Colton for that. So I'm going to ask my panelists to turn their video on and uh, then I can introduce them. Hi everyone. So Sassafras Lowry is an award-winning author whose books have been honored by organizations ranging from the American Library Association to the Dog Writers Asso Association of America. Sassafras's dog books include Tricks in the City, Healing Healing, Bedtime Stories for Rescue Dogs, and Chew This Journal, an activity book for you and your dog. Sassafras is a certified trick dog instructor who lives, writes, and trains in Portland, Oregon. Lily Chin's dog behavior infographics have become a popular tool for dog training professionals, veterinarians, behaviorists, and welfare groups who advocate for humane animal training methods. A partial list of prominent behaviorists, authors, and organizations that have used her dog art include the late Dr. Sophia Yin, Fear Free Pets, the RSPCA, and IAABC. Her best-selling first book, Doggy Language, A Dog Lover's Guide to Understanding Your Best Friend, was published by Summersdale in October 2020 and is being translated into many different languages. Lily Chin is Malaysia-born and currently lives in Los Angeles with two newly adopted cats, Mambo and Shimmy, and her muse is her rescued blue-eyed Boston Terrier, Boogie. And tonight's conversation is being chaired by Christy Benson, who is special correspondent to Companion Animal Psychology and the Positive Post. Christy is an honors graduate of the prestigious Academy for Dog Trainers, where she earned her certificate in training and counseling. She's also gained her PCBCA, which is a credential from the Pet Professional Accreditation Board. She's recently moved to beautiful Northern British Columbia, uh, where she continues to help dog guardians through online teaching and consultations. Christy's on staff at the Academy for Dog Trainers, helping to shape the next generation of canine professionals. Christy's dogs are mostly rescue sled dogs, mostly retired and thoroughly enjoying a good snooze in front of the wood stove, possibly right now. So 10 years is an amazingly long time in blog years and I wanted to celebrate companion animal psychology and who better do, to do so than with Christy who is part of companion animal psychology now and with two amazing authors who I've interviewed for the blog and whose books are also about having a better relationship with your pet. So what we're going to do, we're going to have a section for each author uh, in conversation with Christy and each author will also do a reading and the order of that will be me first and then Sassafras and then Lily and then at the end we've got time for all of your questions so remember you can type your questions in the question and answer box so um, we will all pose for a, a screenshot um, with our books so if you want to take a picture you'll be able to take a picture of us all
Awesome, thank you. And if you didn't get it, you'll be able to get that from the recording anyway. So this event is about reading about both dogs and cats. So let me know in the chat if you are more of a dog person, more of a cat person or both, because I think all of us here are both. And um, so we're gonna, I'm gonna hand over to Christy to chair the conversation and Sassafras and Lily, I'm gonna ask you to turn your cameras off for a moment and we'll get started. Christy, you're on mute. <laughs> oh, crap, two years of the pandemic, you think that we would have sorted that out already. <laughs> Okay, so I was just saying thanks so much for inviting me. I'm so excited to hear you speak and the other authors speak. Um, so some questions for you just to start. Um, per The Science of Making Your Cat Happy, it follows your award-winning book, WAG, The Science of Making Your Dog Happy. So just tell me a little bit about Per. So Per is designed to help people know what will make their cat happy and to understand the science behind those suggestions. So research actually shows that the number one issue facing pet cats is behavior issues due to a poor home environment. And so many of us don't have everything set up right for our cats in their home. So that's one of the things that you'll find in PER is a lot of information. So PER is about the science, what we know from feline science, but it's also absolutely packed with practical tips and it takes you through from getting a kitten or adopting an adult cat right through to having a senior cat and helping them feel more comfortable and to making those difficult decisions at the end of life. And every chapter in per ends with a set of tips. And then right at the end of the book, there's a checklist for a happy cat that you can use to see what you're already doing right and should do more of, or if there's anything new that you want to try to see if you can make your cat even happier. Wonderful. So in both PER and WAG, you write about how we can use science, and you just mentioned that even in your last answer, how we can use science to make cats and dogs happier. So why is science important for our pets? The thing is that over the last 15 years or so, there's been an explosion of research on canine science and feline science is kind of, it's following behind. There's an increase in that, but it's, it's got a long way to catch up, but it is catching up. And so much of this is relevant to our ordinary lives with our cats and so um, in WAG with our dogs and one example of that is the research on reward based training methods um, because there's a huge body of research now that looks at the risks of using aversive methods and it finds that if you're using shock or prong collars or leash corrections there are risks to your dog's welfare which would be the risks of fear anxiety stress aggression a worse relationship with the guardian and also um, they're more likely to be pessimistic uh, rather than optimistic and I think we all get pets because we want to have a good relationship with them. And although for cats, there's less research on that, we also know that for cats, there is a risk of damaging your relationship with your cat if you're squirting them with a water bottle, for example. So that's one example where it shows us that we need to train dogs and cats with positive reinforcement. Um, and it's very effective. And most of the time, that's going to mean that we're using little pieces of food to train the dog. And just as another quick example, um, there's an increasing amount of research on the importance of enrichment. So we know that dogs that get taken for more walks are less likely to have behavior issues. And we know that cats that get more playtime with their guardian, like with the one toy, are less likely to have behavior issues. And um, of course, there's some issues to unpack with how the research is done. But at the same time, we know that walks are good for dogs and we know that playing with the one toy is fun for you and fun for your cat as well. So if we can all make more time to do those things with our pet, it's good for them. And science says it too. Cool. Well. Um, so can you tell me about food puzzle toys and how often we should use them to feed our cats? Yeah, so the thing about cats is that if a cat was providing their own food and having to hunt for their food, they would be catching about 10 to 12 mice a day. So that's a lot of small meals. A mouse is only a small meal. They can't share it with another cat. And it's a lot of tiny meals throughout the day. Now, we can't realistically give our cat 10 meals a day. But more realistically, we could try to give them five small meals a day and break their food portion down into five small pieces, including something at supper time that will help them not get too hungry in the night and hopefully not wake you up by howling for food first thing in the morning. And I say that because that's what I have to do for my cat, Harley. <laughs> um, so it helps to feed them small meals. And if you're out during the day, obviously you can use a timed feeder to deliver those meals. And food puzzle toys are a way of making your cat work for their food. So especially if your cat is an indoors only cat, 
Um, it's good for them to have to work for their food. But the interesting thing is that science shows that so far, cats are the only species that have been found to prefer free food rather than working for their food. <laughs> Nonetheless, <laughs> we still recommend that people use food puzzle toys with their cat. And what you can take from that research perhaps is that you should make them very easy for your cat when you're introducing them and you should fill them to the brim and put treats in them to make them really interesting and engaging for your cat and it gives your cat something to do so it's a nice piece of enrichment for your cat awesome <clears throat> so i think you alluded to this earlier but cats can be trained absolutely um, even to do tricks uh, so why is it a good idea to train our our cats yeah, so cats can be trained and it's a myth that cats can't be trained and we can train cats in the same way as dogs using positive reinforcement. With cats they need to be tiny, tiny, tiny food rewards because obviously cats are that much smaller. Um, so you can train cats to do tricks and that can be a nice enrichment activity for them. If you want to, you can even get your cat certified as a trick cat or you can teach them to do nose work and get them certified as a nose work cat if you wish. But the main use of training for cats is actually to teach them things that they need to know to be happy and comfortable in their everyday life. And the prime example of that is teaching your cat to go in their carrier to take them to the vet because it makes taking to th them to the vet so much easier. And there is research which shows that if the cat has been trained to go in their carrier, then the vet exam proceeds much more easily, it proceeds much more quickly, and the vet is actually able to finish the exam instead of having to give it up because the cat is stressed. So at the back of PER, you will find a training plan to teach your cat to go in their carrier. And that's whether you're starting with a cat who's never gone in the carrier before, because obviously it's easier if you're starting with a kitten. But also if you already have a cat who is terrified of their carrier, it's still going to help you. It's just going to take longer to go through. And there's also a plan to teach your cat a neat trick as well. Cool. Um, so in, in Purr, you balance the science and tips with stories about your own cat. So how did you approach the writing um, of these different sections? Yeah, and I do the same in WAG. I have sections about my dogs and I wanted to include them because I think it helps to put a more personal touch on the book. Of course, I love telling people about my cats. Um, so that's another reason. But I think it helps to put a personal touch on the science and show how I use the science and the things that I've learned from the research I've done for the book and from what I know about you know, studying cat behavior. Um, so it's put lots of examples in. For example, my cats are both indoors only because of where I live. That's the only way that they would be safe. But despite that, they still sometimes have encounters with wildlife through the window. Um, and so you can read about those in the book. And similarly in WAG, I had lots of examples about Bodger and Ghost, including an example of when I made a, a mistake with Bodger when I was trying to teach him to get used to the barred owl. But I think it helps to have those stories in. And I feel very lucky that I get to share them with people. And actually, I'll be sharing a little bit of that in my reading. Oh, awesome. Well, that sets us up perfectly. And so today you're going to be reading from Purr. Can you please go ahead and do your reading now? I am. Thank you. So I'm reading from the beginning, the very beginning of Purr. Um, Melina is busy trying to distract me from writing this book. She's already walked in front of the computer screen two times. And just now she's come to sit next to my keyboard looking hopeful. Of course, I can't resist. I reach out a hand and she sniffs it and then rubs the side of her head on it. Next, she raises her head slightly to make it easier for me to pet her under the chin, just how she likes it. Her purr is soft and melodic. Then, satisfied, she leaps to the window ledge behind my monitor to watch the world outside for a while, the tip of her tail twitching ever so slightly. Anyone who thinks that pet cats don't care about their people isn't paying enough attention. This is a problem for cats. People think they're easy pets, so don't provide what they need. We have so many stereotypes about cats as loners and jerks and just difficult animals that it's as if no one sees the actual cat in front of them, a beautiful fluffy bundle who wants and craves your attention, albeit on their own terms, who delights in chasing the one toy and who loves to snooze in the sunny spots of your home. But who also likes somewhere small and cozy to curl up and relax and be safe. When you see cats for who they are and give them what they need, they will be happier, they'll be less likely to have behavior problems and your efforts will be repaid with feline affection. For most cats, happiness isn't being squished and petted for half an hour and then ignored for the rest of the day. Cats have their little quirks and that's what we love about them. But at the same time, 
every cat has a set of needs that we should meet, and I'm sure they care about us. Take the way Melina just jumped back to my desk and stiff noses with me, a feline greeting, before rubbing her head on my forehead, soft warm fur, and no doubt some pheromones that I can't detect left behind in a streak against my skin. This head rubbing, or bunting as it is technically called, is an important behavior between cats who are part of the same social group. Now Melina has leapt up to the top of the bookshelves where she can survey the room but is still close by and can watch my work. If I look up at her, there, I get a slow blink, which of course I return. Meanwhile, my other cat Harley, a hefty tabby, is under my desk near my feet. No doubt this has something to do with the fact that the heat is on and the heat vent under my desk is blowing out nice warm air, but still, he has the whole house with a heat vent in every room to choose from. Indeed, he's already spent part of the morning, as he usually does, completely blocking the heat vent in the hall so that he's nice and warm, but no hot air escapes around him into the house. And now he's picked the vent near me. In his own way, he's choosing to be close to me. And probably soon, like most days, he will jump on my lap and demand lots of petting. Then climb on my desk, tramp on my keyboard and get picked up and removed to my old office chair, which I've had to keep because he likes to relax in it so much. The domestic cat is descended from Felis Libica, a desert cat that is still found in parts of Africa. Occasionally, bones of cats have been found in Bronze Age and Iron Age settlements, and the presence of skinned cat bones in an archaeological site in Coppergate, York, shows that in Anglo-Saxon England, at least some cats were used for their fur. A 9th century poem, Panga Ban, shows that sometimes cats had names, which speaks of cats as companions, but the oldest known case of a domestic cat living alongside humans dates from the Middle Ages in Kazakhstan along the Silk Route by which people and goods moved from East Asia to Persia, East Africa and Southern Europe. Up until very recently indeed, domestic cats were prized for their abilities to catch rodents. Now they're increasingly seen as part of the family and often live indoors, no mice in sight. Everyone who loves cats knows that each cat has their own individual personality and preferences. When we think of pet cats in their homes, we think of much loved pets who get to snooze all day long. But what if many of those cats are actually bored out of their mind and stressed by their home life? And that's why I wrote Purr. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Zazie, that was wonderful. Um, so I would like to invite Sassafras to come back on. Hello. Hi. <laughs> it's so lovely to have you. Um, so today you'll be reading from To This Journal, which is just awesome. I, I managed to finish reading it yesterday and just loved it. I love how interactive it is. Um, but you've written several other fantastic dog books. And I want to start by asking you about Tricks in the City for Daring Dogs and the Humans That Love Them. Uh, so this is a really fun book with tons of different tricks in it. How did you go about making sure that the book was suitable for all dogs and all dog guardians? Yeah, so Tricks in the City is a book that is filled with instructions for how to teach your dog all kinds of fun, different tricks from very basic tricks to really advanced tricks. And when I was writing the book, I really wanted to focus on the diversity of tricks that are out there and thinking a lot about accessibility of different sorts of dogs. So as a uh, trick evaluator with the American Kennel Club and with Do More With Your Dog, I've had the privilege of working with over 300 uh, dogs and handler teams all over the world of all different sizes. And that definitely informed me when I was writing the book, um, thinking about what are different tricks that different kinds of dogs can do and thinking about calling that out and thinking in the book and also including tricks that were super accessible. Uh, at the time I was writing the book, it was also before uh, my two senior dogs had passed. And so at the time I had a pack of three dogs, which were about as diverse as you can get. I had a seven 17 year old Chihuahua mix. I had a, at the time, a two year old Newfoundland, and I had a 10 year old, around 10 ish former street dog, um, cattle dog cross. So I was really thinking about everything from toy breeds to giants and everything in between. Fun. So one of your books is an experimental nonfiction book called With Me. Um, which Dogster Magazine just called Perfect for Dog Lovers Everywhere. 
Uh, so with me is about the joy of dog sports. Tell me about your approach to writing that book. Yeah, so with me is the second book then in kind of a, a really fun process that I've been thinking about that's looking at dog sports and also really at its root more than that, our relationship and our connection with dogs um, and putting that on the page in new and interesting ways. So outside of the dog world, I'm probably best known as a fiction author, but I really enjoy playing with creative form. And several years ago, um, actually while I was doing a, my master's of fine arts in creative writing, I got, I was looking at, um, a course map for a dog agility course and for rally obedience courses. And what I saw on the page, course maps are what handlers get before they do a competition run. It's telling you where to go. And looking at that course map, what I saw was something that looked almost poetic. And I was like, oh my God, what if, what if we use, I use that form as kind of a framework for telling stories about what is it actually like to develop a training and working relationship with dogs through sports. So that's what I was doing um, in With Me. And I was thinking about that actually, and I, it was written during the early days of the pandemic and ways that dog sports were for me sort of this balm to sort of soothe myself um, and my dog in those times. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so you collaborated with Lily Chin on an indie book called William to the Rescue, Bedtime Stories for Rescue Dogs. So how did that book come about? And do you have any tips for writers um, on working with an artist? Such a fun process, and <laughs> I'm so excited Lily's here. Um, yeah, it was absolutely a dream come true for me to get to work with Lily on this book. It was so much fun to put together. The idea for the book actually came about when I had, years before it was um, written or published, when I had first brought home my former street dog, Charlotte, who has since passed. But one of the things that I did when I, when I brought her home in a way that we bonded is I would read her stories um, as she was adjusting to our life. We lived in New York City in our busy apartment. And it was just a way I could get her used to our, our home. And I was like, wouldn't it be fun if there were books that were that were for her or for dogs like her? Because I started posting about it and I learned that I was not the only person doing this. And in fact, a whole lot of people uh, were reading stories to their dogs. And so I had this idea of writing stories um, that were bedtime stories for rescue dogs. And so uh, I talked to Lily and she so graciously was as excited about the project as I was and William to the Rescue became the book and it's absolutely gorgeous and it was incredible to watch her take this idea and this story that I had and bring it to life and I think that the second part of your question you know my advice for writers wanting to collaborate with artists is very much to think about it as a collaborative process this isn't just you know, one person's project, it really needs to be, or at least for me, to make it as enjoyable as it was, um, make it that collaborative experience of, you know, both people are bringing things to the table and really thinking critically about how to make that story come to life and what that will look like. Amazing. That was an awesome answer. Thank you. Um, so the book you're reading from today is the Chew This Journal, an activity book for you and your dog. Tell me about that book. Yeah, so Chew This Journal is, was such a fun book to put together. Um, it is a culmination of so many of the activities that I really like to do with my own dogs. And it combines training games and some trick stuff and uh, foundations for sports with crafts and lots and lots of enrichment activities. The Really the goal is for people and their dogs to have fun together and to be a book that is full of games and activities that can be done, whether you live in a big city or you live somewhere rural, or you have all day to think about ways to enrich your dog's life, or you have just a few minutes on your lunch break. I love how it would almost be like a baby book at the end. You know, you could go back in 20 years and look at it and, and be reminded of all these special times. I thought that was really special. Yeah, it definitely is supposed to be, you know, the idea is that it has places for you to write in it yourself, to paste things in and make it a book that really belongs to your, you and your dog. Cool. Um, so I've heard uh, that you've got some exciting news about your next book. So when, uh, what will it be and when will it be out? 
Yeah, so there's going to be a cat edition of To This Journal called Claw This Journal, <laughs> and it is releasing uh, in October. So very, very soon. It's currently available for pre-order at Target and Barnes and Noble and Amazon and indie bookstores. So any, whatever your favorite bookstore is, um, it can be pre-ordered now. And it's filled with enrichment activities and crafts and games and all kinds of ways to have fun with your cat um, and also record those in a similar way to do this journal, be able to record those activities that you're engaging with on the page and create a keepsake for you and your cat. Wonderful. Um, so today you are reading from to this journal. Uh, please go ahead and do your reading. Thank you. So I'm going to be reading from the beginning of to this journal. My earliest childhood memories revolve around dogs, dreaming of them, learning about them, and eventually, when I got a dog of my own, finding ways to have fun together. As a teenager in the 90s, I began channeling my infatuation for dogs into training and competing in the sport of dog agility. I've learned far more from dogs than I have ever taught them. The greatest joy in my life is spending time with my dogs and having the opportunity to learn with them. I believe that dogs, no matter the dogs, not only make my life more interesting, they truly make me a more thoughtful, mindful, and engaged person. As a certified trick dog instructor, I see it as one of my missions in life to support dogs in getting opportunities to have more fulfilled and enriched lives by doing things that they love. Part of this is assisting people to better understand, support, advocate for, and engage with their dogs. For me, training dogs isn't about telling them what to do. Rather, it's about developing a channel for pet owner and dog to communicate with each other. Much more important to me than any ribbon, title, or award has and continues to be the deep pleasure in spending time with dogs, having fun together, and developing new paths of shared understanding and language. Several years ago, I began practicing goal setting, bullet journaling, and memory keeping on paper as a way to remember, structure, and organize my training adventures with my dogs. This practice has enabled me to keep track of all the fun things we do together and track progress towards the goals we set. Practical training and grooming goals, as well as exercise, travel, and even bucket lists and vacations. I've tried to incorporate into this book easy step-by-step -step ideas for introducing those same simple journaling and tracking techniques into your routine, as well as many of the same training and activity challenges my dogs and I regularly do. I have a three-year-old Newfoundland who is over 100 pounds and a 10-pound 17-year-old Chihuahua mix. Having dogs of such radically different sizes and ages made me very aware of how important it was to select activities for this book that are appropriate and accessible for dogs of a wide variety of ages and abilities. This book is filled with crafts, games, puzzles, and other opportunities for you to keep memories of what makes your dog special and unique. The world can sometimes feel like an overwhelming, confusing place but dogs help us to see the joy in simple everyday moments. If you are reading this book, you probably love dogs just as much as I do. These activities are some of my dog's favorite things and we're thrilled to share these adventures with you. I hope that to this journal will inspire you to find new ways to connect, play and spend intentional time with your dogs. Thank you. That was beautiful, thank you. <clears throat> so I would like to invite Lily to come on camera. Hi. Hi. Hi, Christy. <laughs> it's so lovely to see you again. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so your gorgeous book, Doggy Language, has been a huge success. Can you tell me about that book? Okay, so um, Doggy Language is an illustrated gift book about dog body language. Um, it was published in end of 2020 and the way it happened was that I was approached by Summersdale publishers in the UK because they'd seen my doggy language poster starring my dog Boogie and they wanted to turn that into a book. Um, it 
it's sort of like I would don't it's really a gift book it's supposed to be an introduction to reading dog body language for the general public so it is mostly illustration there's very little text but it is a combination of like many years of me working as an illustrator for dog trainers and welfare groups and you know doing dog body language charts for like dog bite prevention programs and uh, stress-free training and you know to help people um, communicate better with their dog and understand what their dog may be feeling so that they can prevent bad feelings or aversive experiences so yeah so i'm really thrilled that it's been so popular it wasn't intended to be an educational serious book but it's become really useful for a lot of people so that makes me happy absolutely i love how you you keep reminding us to look at the context and the whole dog and then you sort of integrate that message right into your drawing it's, it's really it's really good that way yeah yeah that um yeah that that was important to me to make sure that i always um i tried to draw the whole dog as often as possible yeah so you are well known for your drawings of dogs cats hedgehogs and other animals how did you get into drawing dogs in the first place okay so i had no idea i would be getting into drawing dogs when i first started this um, my background is in animation 2d animation which was drawing for um cartoons uh, shows on TV and the internet and movie. Uh, and uh, I adopted my dog, Boogie, so around 2007. And that was when I started getting into pet portraits as a side business. And from pet portraits, I moved into doing uh, infographics and educational illustration for dog people because Boogie, my dog, bit somebody and had aggression issues. And then I had to learn about dog behavior and dog training myself which kind of took me on this journey about dog behavior and I became obsessed learning about it and saw the difference it made to my relationship with Boogie so um, which led to posters and infographics and and work in that area and um, you know so so today my business is doggydrawings.net and I don't just do infographics I still do portraits and I also sell uh, gift items like pins and prints and um, various things that are dog or cat related. Yeah, so it did start with one dog. <laughs> <laughs> I think that is the story for a lot of us. Dog yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> so what was your approach to all the different drawings in doggy language? Um, so uh, the important thing for me was to make it fun and cute and uh, originally my publisher wanted it to be a book about a book version of doggy language the poster which is just my dog but um, they changed their mind and suggested a book with lots of different dog breeds which was really exciting to me because um, my Boston Terrier doesn't have a tail or he didn't have a tail so you know and he had upright ears so this um, project uh, sort of launched me into a whole bunch of research into what dogs with floppy ears look like when they're stressed and when they're happy and what do different tails look like different body types uh, so it was a really fun project to research and to draw and uh, and i wanted to make the language accessible as well because um, i'm sort of in, within the dog community like there's a lot of jargon and um, even though i know what the jargon means i know that you know a lot of people wouldn't so it was a, a, a fun challenge to rewrite it in a way that would be more accessible to as many people as possible. Absolutely, yeah, you did a great job with that. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so doggy language has been translated into several different languages. How many languages has it been translated into and how did they come about? So um, it's been translated to 15 languages so far. And I, wow. as far as I know, like 11 of those are available now. And if you go to doggylanguagebook.com, there's like links to where you can purchase the different languages. Um, a question that I get asked a lot from people who email me is like, how can I translate your book into my language? And uh, I, I should mention that I have no authority over that. That has nothing to do with me. Um, my publisher, Summersdale, they own all the foreign language rights. So um, what usually happens is that they pitch the book to publishers in other countries who then purchase the foreign language rights and they produce and publish the foreign editions. So that's how it works. And um, 
you know, I'm really grateful to all the people who want to translate it, but it's outside my hands. Right. Yeah. So you also have got some exciting news about your next book. So what will it be and when is it coming out? Um, yeah. So, well, first of all, I should mention that I, last year I illustrated a kid's picture book called What's Up Pup. And it's also dog body language related, oh. but it's for very young children. It's all illustrated, written by Kirsten Hamilton and published by FSG Macmillan. So that's coming out later this year. But the, the book that I'm writing and illustrating right now is, is a cat version of doggy language. Amazing. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's a great time for cat books. <laughs> um, <laughs> kitty language, it's cat body language, and it's um, published by 10 Speed Press, Penguin Random House, and that should be out in summer 2023. Fantastic. It's a great year for cat books, for sure. Yeah. So today you're going to be doing a reading from Doggy Language with a screen share. Um, yes. Can you please go ahead and start your reading? Okay, let me share screen. Okay. Whoops. Okay. I. All right. So I'm just going to. Um, so please bear with me. I was going to do this as a presentation, but but I hope this will be okay. So um, I'm just going, so this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to read from a few, I've selected a few uh, pages from the middle of the book rather than the beginning. I'm going to read for a few pages from two chapters, Conflicted and Stressed and Posture. Um, I'm first going to do my best to describe the illustration and then I'll read the text on the page next to it, the visual signs and what the dog may be feeling. So um, I picked this first page, Angry Explosive, because um, my introduction to dog body language was when my newly adopted dog Boogie 15 years ago would try to lunge and bite other people and dogs. So my dog trainer at the time introduced me to books and a DVD on dog body language. And I remember that at that time, that this was all like mind blowing knowledge to me. I was seeing small behaviors that I hadn't seen before and when I started seeing them, I couldn't unsee them. So uh, the first page I'm reading from is from the chapter Conflicted or Stressed, Lip or Nose Lick. And the image shows a little corgi looking dog and a little kid approaching that dog with his hand reaching towards the corgi. And the corgi licks his nose. And there's a thought bubble that says, this is hard. So visual signs, quick licking of lip or nose when there is no food present. What your dog may be feeling, concerned, uneasy, needing to reduce tension, or saying, please take it easy. Uh, next page, conflicted or stressed, ground sniffing or digging. And um, the image shows a sort of border terrier looking type puppy. Uh, there's a duck approaching him, just staring at him on the side. And this puppy is not looking at the duck. He's looking at the ground, sniffing, no eye contact. And the thought bubble says, maybe if I ignore it, it will go away. Visual signs. Suddenly sniffing the ground or digging where someone or something appears. There may be nothing on the ground. What your dog may be feeling. Anxious, uncertain about the situation, needing to focus on something else, wanting to avoid interaction. This is too weird. Don't mind me, I'm not interesting. Next page, conflicted or stressed, head turning away. And we've got a sort of Jack Russell Terrier type looking doggy sitting down and a hand is reaching towards him and he's turning his head away. And the thought bubble says, um, I don't know. So head turning away or offering one's back is often misinterpreted as impolite or stubborn. The visual signs, turning head away or looking away from the source of stress. What your dog may be feeling, uneasy, confused, needing to ease tension, wanting to politely interrupt an interaction, or saying, excuse me a moment. Next page, conflicted or stressed, freezing or stillness. And there's a poodly looking dog, he's walking in and then he stops and his muscles go tense. And there's a thought bubble above his head that says, oh no. Uh, the second image of the same poodly puppy and he is lying down flat on the ground, looking stressed and a treat is presented to him and he's not eating the treat, the thought bubble above his head says, I can't eat. Freezing or stillness when not followed by playful movements. 
Freezing is often mistaken for calmness. The visual signs are closed mouth, held breath, body still intense, tail is stiff, not responsive, immovable. What your dog may be feeling, concern, anxiety, fear. Longer freezing or planting flat on the ground may indicate that the dog is so stressed that they have shut down. If freezing precedes stalking, see page 38, the dog is feeling confident and focused. All right, next page is from the posture chapter. We can tell a lot about a dog's mood by changes in their overall body posture and movement. So the image shows a dog who's just walking along on leash. His ears are up, rotated for listening. His uh, eyes are looking forward. His mouth is slightly open, relaxed, with the tongue showing. His tail is relaxed, hanging down. There's no tension in his body. And the thought bubble above his head says, all the smells and the love heart. Relaxed, happy-go-lucky. So the visual signs are no tension in face and body, balanced weight, easy movements. What your dog may be feeling, happy-go-lucky, enjoying their environment, not focused on anything in particular, just hanging out. Next page. Posture, alert, interested. The, the dog stops moving. He's still on leash. His tail is going up. His ears are going forward. His head has gone up a bit higher. His mouth starts to close and he's looking straight ahead. Thought bubble says, what is this? Visual signs. Ears move forward and up, head and body lean forward, tail moves up. What your dog may be feeling, interested, surprised, curious, something has changed in their environment. Other body language details will indicate whether this is curiosity or concern. And the next image, unsure. Uh, the image of a dog, his body has lowered to the ground, um, his back legs are still where they are, but his front legs have moved forward and his head has moved forward. Uh, back legs way back, tail has gone stiff, ears have moved backwards, um, he's sniffing, his head is lower, and there's a thought bubble about, above his head with question marks. Visual signs. Front end is leaning forward while weight is still on the back end. Head and ears are lowered. What your dog may be feeling? Unsure, cautious, conflicted. Do I approach or retreat? Needing to get more information. Ready to escape. Am I safe? Other body language details can indicate whether this is curiosity or anxiety. And um, that's it. That's the end of the reading. So uh, remember, look at the whole body. Always look at the dog's whole body in addition to single body parts. What does the dog's overall posture and movement look like? Feelings are contextual. While a dog's body language tells us what they're feeling, we don't have the full picture without considering the context. What is going on? How is a dog's body language changing in relation to what is happening? and every dog is an individual. A dog's expressiveness is also dependent on their age, health, breed, physical type, and unique past experiences. A puppy's communication style will be different from that of an adult dog. It is normal for different dogs to respond differently to the same situation. And that's the end of the reading. Thank you. Thank you, Lily, that was amazing. So I'd like to invite all the authors to come back on camera. Okay, so we will get to audience questions and there's some good ones there, I'm excited. Um, but I have one more question for each of our authors first. Uh, so um, I would just like to ask you where people can go to learn more about you, like your website, uh, your social media. So let's start with Zazie. Thank you. So if people want to know more about me, they can visit companionanimalpsychology.com and there's a bar along the bottom that will let you sign up for my newsletter and you can also find links there to me on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. Perfect. So that's it for us. Yeah, so uh, people can visit me online at sassafraslowry.com or find me on social media at sassafraslowry on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. Uh, and also my dog's Instagram, which is far more fun than mine will ever be, which is Sirius the Bear. Uh, and I'm also Introvert Circus on YouTube. Perfect. Lily? Um, my website is doggydrawings.net, that's D-O-G-G-I-E, drawings.net, and um, if you go there, there should be links to, to all my social media and also the book website. Okay, perfect. So let's pop into the question and answer box and get to these questions. Um, so I think this is probably one for Zazie. 
Uh, Joanne asks, I can get my cat into the carrier, but she's Whoops. Christy's frozen on us. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, I, I can see the question, so I'm going to read the question until Christy comes back. So I can get my cat in the carrier, but she's not pleasant at the vet. She wants to swat the vet and hisses. I do give her gabapentin prior to the visit. Is there anything else I can do to calm her down? Thanks. Sorry, Christy, you froze for a moment there. Sorry. Um, yeah, so that's a really great question. And this is something that so many people have trouble with. So it's wonderful that your cat is used to going in their carrier. And I think that's a really important start to the question. It's very, very common for cats to need gabapentin for vets to decide that they recommend that and just if it helps to make you feel any better about that uh, one of my cats Harley often has gabapentin before he goes to the vet because he's diabetic he has to have blood tests every time and if he gets too stressed those those tests don't work so if that's what your vet is recommending I think well done for following your vet's advice basically it's a good thing but the other thing is we know about husbandry training for dogs but we also can do husbandry training for cats the disadvantage is we don't have any good plans for doing so at the moment but maybe some of us will work on this you can find some good videos um, there are several people on YouTube who have good videos. iCat Care has some good videos, International Cat Care, and information on training your cat for different things as well. Um, so you could look there for some good ideas and basically use treats to train your cat to tolerate and hopefully enjoy being handled. But expect to train very, very slowly and for it to take much longer than you think because you have to work at your cat's pace. Thank you, Zazie. Uh, so our next question is gonna be for Lily. Um, someone, um, an anonymous person said, I volunteer for a rescue and would like to know if you have educational posters that can be shared on our website. I'm always looking for ways to educate. Yes, um, if you go to doggydrawings.net slash free posters, I have a selection of infographics and things um, that can be downloaded and printed for free. And you're welcome to use any of those. Wonderful, that's a great service. Thank you, Lily. Um, so maybe this next question can go to Sassafras. What advice or guidance do you have for an established behavior professional who has an idea for a book? Complete a rough manuscript and then shop it or shop the concept first or self-publish? Yeah, it's a great question. It's a big question. <laughs> um, it's one that often is really going to be varied based on what that individual's goals are and honestly what the book is. Um, which is just leading a panel conversation about this with uh, Publishers Weekly's conference last week. Um, it really depends, which is a horrible answer to give at a panel like this. So fiction books um, in general, there's exceptions, but fiction books almost always need to be completely written before you can start querying them or shopping them. Uh, Nonfiction books are a little bit more of murky gray area. It depends on um your you know your brand what you sort of what kind of following you have if you are you know it sounds like this person um, has an established name and career and so you can put together what's called a book proposal and which would be sort of a sections of the book there's lots of information that are sort of beyond the scope of this but to put together a proposal and then starting to shop that and the decision about whether to traditionally publish or to self-publish again super personal. There's huge pros and cons of both, in my opinion. I'm what's called a hybrid author. I have 10 books in print. Uh, a little over half of them are traditionally published and a little under half of them are self-published. And so I always think there's big wins to both directions, both in terms of reach as well as creative control. So it really comes down to what your personal goals are for that book uh, and as well as your existing platform and reach. Awesome, thank you. Um, so we have another question for Zazi. Uh, in your research, did you find information about where the quote crazy cat lady idea comes from or other negative connotations towards cats that we often see today where people see cats as evil, deceptive or you know, other negative labels? We do, and I think it's such a shame that we see those stereotypes because cats are wonderful creatures and they're completely unfair stereotypes. And also people seem to think it's acceptable, unfortunately, to say that they hate cats and really 
a lot of people don't understand cats and I think that's part of it that cats haven't been domesticated as long as dogs so they're harder to read their body language for example but at the same time I feel like there are lots of gender stereotypes that go into this um, and when we look at dogs and especially when we look at some of those outdated ideas about training dogs about dominance and so on we see a lot of very macho masculine stereotypes there and unfortunately we go to cats and we see much more misogynistic stereotypes um, and so some of it I think has a really really long tail that goes all the way back to when cats were hated women with cats were persecuted and said to be witches and burned at the stake and so on I think some of it probably has carried on from there and I think it's really really unfortunate and that in a society which um, if people want to make comments against women it's just something that they can use as a way to get at women and to dismiss what they're saying unfortunately um, and I think that's a real real shame and I hope that we will be able to change the view of cats because cats are wonderful and people who care for cats obviously are wonderful people too by definition um, so yeah it's a great question thank you I think I'm going to pop to another question for Lily here um, you mentioned about dog body language for kids uh, what's up pup when will this be available um you know, I don't have the exact date, but I believe it'll be available around November of 2022, I hope. If there are no delays with due to COVID, I, it should be around that time. Okay. Um, just doing some scrolling. Oh, so maybe this is a question for everybody. I'm not sure. I live in Europe, in Finland. Do you know if it's possible to order, get your books delivered here? So, so Zazi, is that, let's start with you. So it's not translated into Finnish, unfortunately, maybe one day, but certainly you can order online from uh, bookstores because it's available from all good bookstores for WAG for order and PER for pre-order now from any independent bookstore who will probably ship to you um, in Finland. Sassafras? Yeah, absolutely. Similarly, uh, not translated, but in English, um, all of my books are globally available from your favorite bookstore and very easily from Amazon. Lily? Um, so it is, my book is translated into Finnish. And um, <laughs> if you go to doggylanguagebook.com, there is a link to a, to the Finnish publisher and where you can purchase that. But um, the English edition is also available from all main, all big bookstores, including Amazon, you know, IndieBound, you know, wherever you buy books. Okay, perfect. So Zazie, I think another one for you. Do you discuss in your uh, book, what people should do depending on the behavior that they're seeing in their cats. Like, is there how-to information, I guess? I do. I have a chapter about um, behavior issues in cats that goes through some of the more common behavior issues. And I have a section earlier on about some of the body language that you can see. And so it discusses what you should do. It talks about the science behind it and the different recommendations for that. So for example, I talk about fear in cats and I even talk a bit about separation related issues in cats because with the pandemic and people having been at home and then going back to work, that's a possibility in cats too. So I talk about different behavior issues, cats getting on with each other when you should see your vet, um, because for many issues, it's important to see your vet to rule out potential medical issues first um, and then things that you can do and a lot of the, of the things that you can do to make your cat feel less stressed are to do with how you set up your home for your cat and there are tips for that throughout the book. Perfect. Uh, so the next question is for Lily um, and it's one of those plain language uh, reaching out questions I think. Would you consider replacing or deleting the word angry from the first page that you showed um, because the, the reactions may be fear-based? Okay, so um, I have a few answers to this question. First of all, I can't delete because that word because the book's been published already. It's already out there. It's been printed. Thousands and thousands of copies have been printed with this word. Um, secondly, I don't see angry as a bad emotion. I think it's a completely normal emotion to have, and it can still be fear-based. But my um, definition of angry in this case is removing an aversive event or person. They, they, um, when a dog is lunging or barking, they want that person to go away. And that is, I mean, I know angry is a label that can be interpreted in many different ways. And, and for some people, it might be, it might not include fear, but it certainly could be an extension of feeling fearful of being scared of something coming at you or something in your presence. And you're angry because you, you told it to go away and it did not go away. So you are 
making a bigger noise about it like go away i told you to go away you're not listening to me why aren't you listening to me so that's a totally normal response a totally normal emotion to have to make something go away and so i don't think um it it doesn't mean that it's not fear-based if that makes sense yeah, absolutely so here's a question i think that anybody could maybe hop in on um with the with regards to adopting a rescue dog do you, um, do you find or have you heard from others that this is a difficult process? I'm trying and I believe I have more than all the right qualities as a person. Um, I've done rescue work and now it's through rescue, rescue, rescue groups and I feel like I'm competing. So Zazie, do you wanna jump in on that one? I think when the pandemic started, so many people rushed out to get dogs that it's just been really, really hard to find a dog. And just to give you an example, I found it hard to find a dog after we lost Bodger just before WAG was published. And obviously we needed some time for grieving before we felt ready for another dog. But once we did, and bearing in mind that we have two cats, so we needed a cat friendly dog. Um, dogs would appear on the website and they would just be gone immediately so even I had trouble finding a dog and eventually I was able to adopt Pepper my senior shit too but I think even though some of that is calming down now um, as people are going back have gone back to work and so on but I think it's still difficult out there and it's worth checking different rescues um, maybe even getting to know some of them because sometimes if they know that someone is looking or they've had someone who's not been able to get a dog before it went to someone else but they will bear you in mind for another dog that comes up that they think might be appropriate so that might help a bit as well and I don't know if Sassafras or Lily has something to add to that no. <laughs> <laughs> it's just hard right now unfortunately yeah. keep trying yeah. obviously you'll give a, a great home to a dog so keep on trying there are lots of cats available <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah um so Christine says I'm a certified professional pet sitter for all pets and I often try to share educational tools with my clients. What would you all recommend for quick things I can leave behind without seeming condescending to them? That's a really good point. Um, are there posters or handouts on pet language? Also, is anyone going to write about other animals like birds? So Lily, maybe we can start with you. Um, I don't know anything about birds, but I have illustrated a cockatoo body language handout um, for uh, Animal Behavior Center. So if you go to their website, I, I think there may be something there to download. I'm not sure. But, um, you know, anybody who wants to, you know, get in touch with me about other species, I'd, I'd, you know, I'd love to see what I can do. Perfect. Sassafras, do you have any good quick um, resources? I don't have any good quick sort of like handouts off the top of my head. Lily's, uh, Lily's resource prints are always what I tend to send people to. I think a little bit different than what this person's asking for in terms of pet sitting. I think that uh, it's, you know, always my number one thing is really thinking about making sure, and this is probably not the answer that somebody wants, is really following exactly the pet owner is asking the sitter to do because I think there may be reasons why in and in some cases you know obviously people just don't know what they don't know but oftentimes um pet owners do have really specific reasons why they might be doing something specific with their pets and not want that are to that routine in some way so that's something that is you know really important to me and no plans for birds. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I have nothing on birds either, but I would say that for all of our books, uh, make good gifts for people and our books that will help people to understand their dog or their cat better. So all of our books are, are good things to look at. On my own website, Companion Animal Psychology, which I've been doing for 10 years, by the way, did I say I've been doing this for 10 years? <laughs> you can find tons of useful information on there, both in terms of the science of what we know about dogs and cats, but also useful tips about how to help a fearful dog feel safe, for example, how to choose the right scratching post for your cat and things like that. So those are good links that you can share with people as well and of course Lily's drawings are great links that you can share with people too and follow uh, people like us on social media and all of us share other people on social media too so we share resources from other people all the time so that's another good thing to look for too. Awesome thank you so I think we can do one more quick question and then I'm going to hand it back to you Zazie because we're, we're just about out of time um, so someone has this interesting question uh, Kelly asks, are there types of cats, you know, like breeds of dogs that are better for families? I've been told orange cats, perhaps like apricot, 
or friendlier? What a lovely question. So uh, <laughs> um, there are some breeds of cat that are said to be better with children um, than others. And some breeds of cat are said to be a bit more independent. So if you're thinking of getting a specific breed, certainly you can look them up on the internet and see if that breed is said to be good with kids, for example. But at the same time, the most important thing is to do with the early socialization of the kitten. So a moggy, a, a mixed breed cat is also going to make a really good family cat. And the most important thing is to know that they have come from a breeder who has done something to socialize the kitten. Because in kittens, the sensitive period for socialization is from two to all the end of seven weeks. Um, so that's much earlier than in puppies and that's finished before the kitten comes to live in your home and you want to make sure that the kitten wasn't raised in a barn but they've actually been in a house where they've been exposed to household noises and where other people have come in and met them and there is some research that shows how important it is for additional people to come and meet the kittens when they're young and then when they come home to your house um, it's important for you to continue to build on that socialization, even though the sensitive period is finished. They'll come to you at eight weeks, probably, if they're a rescue cat, and maybe 12 weeks or perhaps 14 weeks if they come from a breeder and continue to make sure that you're building on those early socialization experiences. And that's the thing that makes the biggest difference. So if you're adopting an adult cat, ask questions about what this cat is like with, with children. What is this cat like in a family environment? And that will help you know if they're the right cat for you. Thank you, Zazie. So I'm going to pass it back over to you um, for the closing comments. Awesome. Well, thank you. I want to say thank you very much, first of all, to our authors, Lily Chin, Sassafras Lowry, for coming to join me today, helping me to celebrate companion animal psychology. Wonderful answers to questions and wonderful readings. And a huge, huge thank you to Christy, special correspondent to companion animal psychology, for chairing <laughs> things today, for doing such a wonderful job as MC. And thank you to Colton as well for being in the chat and for the work that they have done to help keep an eye on things in there. Really, really helpful. And thank you to all of you for coming and joining and watching today and helping to celebrate 10 years of companion animal psychology. So I hope you've enjoyed this event. Um, you can subscribe to companion animal psychology on my website. If you'd like to support us authors, you can order or pre-order our books from all good bookstores now, including from Amazon as well and from your local bookstore. Later today, I will be doing the draw to see who's won the copies of Purr, Wag, Chew This Journal and Doggy Language. So I'll be getting in touch with the winners later. And as well, a reminder that the recording is going to be sent out within the next one to two days. And so thank you very, very much for coming. Bye.